This is an aged quill recording. Spiritual Laws by Rolf Waldo Emerson Narrated by Joseph Vobel The living heaven thy prayers respect, House at once an architect, Querying man's rejected hours, Builds there with eternal towers, Soul in self-commanded works, Fears not undermining days, Grows by decays, And by the famous might that lurks In reaction and recoil, Maley's flame to freeze and ice to boil, Forging through swart arms of offense The silver seat of innocence. When the act of reflection takes place in the mind, When we look at ourselves in the light of thought, We discover that our life is embosomed in beauty. Behind us, as we go, all things assume pleasing forms, As clouds do far off. Not only things familiar and stale, but even the tragic and terrible are comely as they take their place in the pictures of memory. The riverbank, the weed at the waterside, the old house, the foolish person, however neglected in the passing, have a grace in the past. Even the corpse that has lain in the chambers has added a solemn ornament to the house. The soul will not know either deformity or pain. If in the hours of clear reason we should speak severest truth, we should say that we had never made a sacrifice. In these hours the mind seems so great that nothing can be taken from us that seems much. All loss, all pain is particular. The universe remains to the heart unhurt. Neither vexations nor calamities abate our trust. No man ever stated his griefs as lightly as he might. Allow for exaggeration in the most patient and sorely ridden hack that was ever driven. For it is only the finite that has wrought and suffered, the infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. The intellectual life may be kept clean and healthful if man will live the life of nature and not import into his mind difficulties which are none of his. No man need be perplexed in his speculations. Let him do and say what strictly belongs to him, and though very ignorant of books, his nature shall not yield him any intellectual obstructions and doubts. Our young people are diseased with the theological problems of original sin, origin of evil, predestination, and the like. These never presented a practical difficulty to any man, never darkened across any man's road who did not go out of his way to seek them. These are the soul's mumps and measles and whooping coughs, and those who have not caught them cannot describe their health or prescribe their, the cure. A simple mind will not know these enemies. It is quite another thing that he should be able to give account of his faith and expound to another the theory of his self-union and freedom. This requires rare gifts. Yet without this self-knowledge, there may be a sylvan strength and integrity in that which he is. A few strong instincts and a few plain rules suffice us. My will never gave the images in my mind the rank they now take. The regular course of studies, the years of academical and professional education have not yielded me better facts than some idle books under the bench at the Latin school. What we do not call education is more precious than that which we call so. We form no guess at the time of receiving a thought of its comparative value. And education often wastes its effort in attempts to thwart and balk this natural magnetism, which is sure to select what belongs to it. In like manner, our moral nature is vitiated by any interference of our will. People represent virtue as a struggle and take to themselves great airs upon their attainments, and the question is everywhere vexed when a noble nature is commended, whether the man is not better who strives with temptation. But there is no merit in the matter. Either God is there or he is not there. We love characters in proportion as they are impulsive and spontaneous. The less a man thinks or knows about his virtues, the better we like him. Timoleon's victories are the best victories, which ran and flowed like Homer's verses, Plutarch said. When we see a soul whose acts are all regal, graceful and pleasant as roses, we must thank God that such things can be and are, and not only sourly on the angel and say, Crump is a better man with his grunting resistance to all his native devils. Not less conspicuous is the preponderance of nature over will in all practical life. There is less intention in history than we ascribe to it. 
We impute deep-laid, far-sighted plans to Caesar and Napoleon, but the best of their power was in nature, not in them. Men of an extraordinary success in their honest moments have always sung, Not unto us, not unto us. According to the faith of their times, they have built altars to fortune, or to destiny, or to St. Julian. Their success lay in their parallelism to the course of thought, which found in them an unobstructed channel. And the wonders of which they were the visible conductors seemed to the eye their deed. Did the wires generate the galvanism? It is even true that there was less in them on which they could reflect than in another, as the virtue of a pipe is to be smooth and hollow. That which externally seemed will and immovableness was willingness and self-annihilation. Could Shakespeare give a theory of Shakespeare? Could ever a man of prodigious mathematical genius convey to others any insight into his methods? If he could communicate that secret, it would instantly lose its exaggerated value, blending with the daylight and the vital energy, the power to stand and to go. The lesson is forcibly taught by these observations that our life might be much easier and simpler than we make it, that the world might be a happier place than it is, that there is no need of struggles, convulsions, and despairs, of the wringing of the hands and the gnashing of the teeth, that we miscreate our own evils. We interfere with the optimism of nature. For whenever we get this vantage ground of the past or of a wiser mind in the present, we are able to discern that we are begirt with laws which execute themselves. The face of external nature teaches the same lesson. Nature will not have us fret and fume. She does not like our benevolence or our learning much better than she likes our frauds and wars. When we come out of the caucus or the bank or the abolition convention, or the temperance meeting, or the transcendental club, into the fields and woods, she says to us, So hot, my little sir? We are full of mechanical actions. We must needs intermeddle and have things in our own way, until the sacrifices and virtues of society are odious. Love should make joy, but our benevolence is unhappy. Our Sunday schools and churches and pauper societies are yokes to the neck. We pain ourselves to please nobody. There are natural ways of arriving at the same ends at which these aim, but do not arrive. Why should all virtue work in one and the same way? Why should all give dollars? It is very inconvenient to us country folk, and we do not think any good will come of it. We have not dollars. Merchants have. Let them give them. Farmers will give corn. Poets will sing. Women will sow. Laborers will lend a hand. The children will bring flowers. And why drag this dead weight of a Sunday school over the whole Christendom? It is natural and beautiful that childhood should inquire and maturity should teach. But it is time enough to answer questions when they are asked. Do not shut up the young people against their will in a pew and force the children to ask them questions for an hour against their will. If we look wider, things are all alike. Laws and letters and creeds and modes of living seem a travesty of truth. Our society is encumbered by ponderous machinery, which resembles the endless aqueducts which the Romans built over hill and dale and which are superseded by the discovery of the law that water rises to the level of its source. It is a Chinese wall which any nimble tartar can leap over. It is a standing army, not so good as a peace. It is a graduated, titled, richly appointed empire, quite superfluous when town meetings are found to answer just as well. Let us draw a lesson from nature, which always works by short ways. When the fruit is ripe, it falls. When the fruit is dispatched, the leaf falls. The circuit of the waters is mere falling. The walking of man and all animals is a falling forward. All our manual labor and works of strength as prying, splitting, digging, rowing, and so forth, are done by dint of continual falling, and the globe, earth, moon, comet, sun, star, fall forever and ever. The simplicity of the universe is very different from the simplicity of a machine. He who sees moral nature out and out and thoroughly knows how knowledge is acquired and character formed is a pedant. The simplicity of nature is not that which may 
easily be read, but is inexhaustible. The last analysis can no wise be made. We judge of a man's wisdom by his hope, knowing that the perception of the inexhaustibleness of nature is an immortal youth. The wild fertility of nature is felt in comparing our rigid names and reputations with our fluid consciousness. We pass in the world for sex and schools, for erudition and piety, and we are all the time jejun babes. One sees very well how Pyrrhonism grew up. Every man sees that he is that middle point whereof everything may be affirmed and denied with equal reason. He is old, he is young, he is very wise, he is altogether ignorant. He hears and feels what you say of the seraphim and of the tin peddler. There is no permanent wise man except in the figment of the Stoics. We side with the hero as we read or paint against the coward and the robber. And shall be again, not in the low circumstance, but in comparison with the grandeurs possible to the soul. A little consideration of what takes place around us every day would show us that a higher law than that of our will regulates events. That our painful labors are unnecessary and fruitless. That only in our easy, simple, spontaneous action are we strong. And by contenting ourselves with obedience, we become divine. Belief and love, a believing love, will relieve us of a vast load of care. Oh, my brothers, God exists. There is a soul at the center of nature and over the will of every man, so that none of us can wrong the universe. It has so infused its strong enchantment into nature that we prosper when we accept its advice, and when we struggle to wound its creatures, our hands are glued to our sides, or they beat our own breasts. The whole course of things goes to teach us faith. We need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening we shall hear the right word. Why need you choose so painfully your place and occupation and associates and modes of action and of entertainment? Certainly there is a possible right for you that precludes the need of balance and willful election. For you there is a reality, a fit place, and congenial duties. Place yourself in the middle of the stream of power and wisdom which animates all whom it floats. And you are without effort impelled to truth, to right, and a perfect contentment. Then you put all gainsayers in the wrong. Then you are the world, the measure of right, of truth, of beauty. If we would not be marplots with our miserable interferences, the work, the society, letters, arts, science, religion of men would go on far better than now, and the heaven predicted from the beginning of the world, and still predicted from the bottom of the heart, would organize itself, as do now the rose and the air and the sun. I say, do not choose. But that is a figure of speech by which I would distinguish what is commonly called choice among men, and which is a partial act. The choice of the hands, of the eyes, of the appetites, and not a whole act of the man. But that which I call right or goodness is the choice of my constitution, and that which I call heaven and inwardly aspire after is the state or circumstance desirable to my constitution. And the action which I in all my years tend to do is the work for my faculties. We must hold a man amenable to reason for the choice of his daily craft or profession. It is not an excuse any longer for his deeds that they are the custom of his trade. What business has he with an evil trade? Has he not a calling in his character? Each man has his own vocation. The talent is the call. There is one direction in which all space is open to him. He has faculties silently inviting him thither to endless exertion. He is like a ship in a river. He runs against obstructions on every side but one. On that side, all obstruction is taken away and he sweeps serenely over a deepening channel into an infinite sea. This talent and this call depend on his organization or the mode in which the general soul incarnates itself in him. He inclines to do something which is easy to him and good when it is done, but which no other man can do. He has no rival. For the more truly he consults his own powers, the more difference will his work exhibit from the work of another. His ambition is exactly proportioned to his powers. The height of the pinnacle is determined by the breadth of the base. 
Every man has this call of the power to do somewhat unique, and no man has any other call. The pretense that he has another call, a summons by name and personal election and outward signs that mark him extraordinary and not in the role of common men, is fanaticism, and betrays obtuseness to perceive that there is one mind in all the individuals and no respect of persons therein. By doing his work, he makes the need felt which he can supply and creates the taste by which he is enjoyed. By doing his own work, he unfolds himself. It is the vice of our public speaking that it has not abandonment. Somewhere, not only every orator, but every man should let out all the length of all the reins, should find or make a frank and hearty expression of what force and meaning is in him. The common experience is that the man fits himself as well as he can to the customary details of that work or trade he falls into and tends it as a dog turns a spit. Then is he a part of the machine he moves? The man is lost. Until he can manage to communicate himself to others in his full stature and proportion, he does not yet find his vocation. He must find in that an outlet for his character so that he may justify his work to their eyes. If the labor is mean, let him by his thinking and character make it liberal. Whatever he knows and thinks, whatever in his apprehension is worth doing, that let him communicate, or men will never know and honor him aright. Foolish, whenever you take the meanness and formality of that thing you do, instead of converting it into the obedient spiracle of your character and aims. We like only such actions as have already long had the praise of men, and do not perceive that anything man can do may be divinely done. We think greatness entailed or organized in some places or duties in certain office or occasions, and do not see that Paganini can extract rapture from a cat gut, and Eulenstein from a Jew's harp, and a nimble-fingered lad out of shreds of paper with his scissors, and Landseer out of swine, and the hero out of the pitiful habitation and company in which he was hidden. What we call obscure condition or vulgar society is that condition in society whose poetry is not yet written, but which you shall presently make as enviable and renowned as any. In our estimates, let us take a lesson from kings— the parts of hospitality, the connection of families, the impressiveness of death, and a thousand other things royalty makes its own estimate of, and a royal mind will. To make habitually a new estimate, that is elevation. What a man does, that he has. What has he to do with hope or fear? In himself is his might. Let him regard no good as solid, but that which is in his nature, and which must grow out of him as long as he exists. The goods of fortune may come and go like summer leaves. Let him scatter them on every wind as the momentary signs of his infinite productiveness. He may have his own, a man's genius, the quality that differences him from every other, the susceptibility to one class of influences, the selection of what is fit for him, the rejection of what is unfit, determines for him the character of the universe. A man is a method, a progressive arrangement, a selecting principle, gathering his like to him wherever he goes. He takes only his own out of the multiplicity that sweeps and circles round him. He is like one of those booms which are set out from the shore on rivers to catch driftwood, or like the lodestone amongst splinters of steel. Those facts, words, persons, which dwell in his memory without his being able to say why, remain because they have a relation to him not less real for being as yet unapprehended. They are symbols of value to him as they can interpret parts of his consciousness, which he would vainly seek words for in the conventional images of books and other minds. What attracts my attention shall have it, as I will go to the man who knocks at my door, whilst a thousand persons as worthy go by it, to whom I give no regard. It is enough that these particulars speak to me. A few anecdotes, a few traits of character, manners, face, a few incidents have an emphasis in your memory out of all proportion to their apparent significance if you measure them by the ordinary standards. They relate to your gift. Let them have their weight, and do not reject them and cast about for illustration and facts more usual in literature. 
What your heart thinks great is great. The soul's emphasis is always right. Over all things that are agreeable to his nature and genius, the man has the highest right. Everywhere he may take what belongs to his spiritual estate, nor can he take anything else, though all doors were open, nor can all the force of men hinder him from taking so much. It is vain to attempt to keep a secret from one who has a right to know it. It will tell itself. That mood into which a friend can bring us is his dominion over us. To the thoughts of that state of mind he has a right. All the secrets of that state of mind he can compel. This is a law which statesmen use in practice." All the terrors of the French Republic, which held Austria in awe, were unable to command her diplomacy. But Napoleon sent to Vienna, M. de Narbonne, one of the old noblesse, with the morals, manners, and name of that interest, saying that it was indispensable to send to the old aristocracy of Europe men of the same connection, which in fact constitutes a sort of Freemasonry. M. de Narbonne, in less than a fortnight, penetrated all the secrets of the imperial cabinet. Nothing seems so easy as to speak and to be understood. Yet a man may come to find that the strongest of defenses and of ties that he has been understood. And he who has received an opinion may come to find it the most inconvenient of bonds. If a teacher have any opinion which he wishes to conceal, his pupils will become as fully indoctrinated into that as into any which he publishes. If you pour water into a vessel twisted into coils and angles, it is vain to say, I will pour it only into this or that. It will find its level in all. Men feel and act the consequences of your doctrine without being able to show how they follow. Show us an arc of the curve, and a good mathematician will find out the whole figure. We are always reasoning from the seen to the unseen, hence the perfect intelligence that subsists between wise men of remote ages. A man cannot bury his meanings so deep in his book, but time and like-minded men will find them. Plato had a secret doctrine, had he? What secret can he conceal from the eyes of Bacon, of Montaigne, of Kant? Therefore Aristotle said of his works, they are published and not published. No man can learn what he has not preparation for learning. However near to his eyes is the object. A chemist may tell his most precious secrets to a carpenter, and he shall be never the wiser, the secrets he would not utter to a chemist for an estate. God screens us evermore from premature ideas. Our ideas are holden that we cannot see things that stare us in the face until the hour arrives when the mind is ripened. Then we behold them, and the time when we saw them, not, is like a dream. Not in nature, but in man, is all the beauty and worth he sees. The world is very empty, and is indebted to this gilding, exalting soul for all its pride. Earth fills her lap with splendors, not her own. The veil of Tempe, Tivoli, and Rome are earth and water, rocks and sky. There are as good earth and water in a thousand places, yet how unaffecting. People are not the better for the sun and moon, the horizon and the trees, as it is not observed that the keepers of Roman galleries or the valets of of painters have any elevation of thought, or that librarians are wiser men than others. There are graces in the demeanor of a polished and noble person which are lost upon the eye of a churl. These are like the stars whose light has not yet reached us. He may see what he maketh. Our dreams are the sequel of our waking knowledge. The visions of the night bear some proportion to the visions of the day. Hideous dreams are exaggerations of the sins of the day. We see our evil affections embodied in bad physiognomies. On the Alps, the traveler sometimes beholds his own shadow magnified to a giant, so that every gesture of his hand is terrific. My children, said an old man to his boys, scared by a figure in the dark entry, my children, you will never see anything worse than yourselves. As in dreams, so in the scarcely less fluid events of the world, every man sees himself in colossal, without knowing that it is himself." The good, compared to the evil which he sees, is as his own good to his own evil. 
Every quality of his mind is magnified in some one acquaintance, and every emotion of his heart in some one. He is like a quincux of trees, which counts five, east, west, north, or south, or an initial, medial, and terminal acrostic. And why not? He cleaves to one person and avoids another, according to their likeness or unlikeness to himself, truly seeking himself in his associates and moreover in his trade and habits and gestures and meats and drinks, and comes at last to be faithfully represented by every view you take of his circumstances. He may read what he writes. What can we see or acquire but what we are? You have observed a skillful man reading Virgil. Well, that author is a thousand books to a thousand persons. Take the book into your own two hands and read your eyes out. You will never find what I find. If any ingenious reader would have a monopoly of the wisdom or delight he gets, he is as secure now the book is Englished as if it were imprisoned in the Pilou's tongue. It is with a good book as it is with good company. Introduce a base person among gentlemen. It is all to no purpose. He is not their fellow. Every society protects itself. The company is perfectly safe, and he is not one of them, though his body is in the room. What avails it to fight with the eternal laws of mind, which adjust the relation of all persons to each other by the mathematical measure of their havings and beings? Gertrude is enamored of Guy. How high, how aristocratic, how Roman his mien and manners. To live with him were life indeed, and no purchase is too great, and heaven and earth are moved to that end. Well, Gertrude has Guy, but what now avails how high, how aristocratic, how Roman his mien and manners, if his heart and aims are in the Senate, in the theater, and in the billiard room, and she has no aims, no conversation that can enchant her graceful lord? He shall have his own society. We can love nothing but nature. The most wonderful talents, the most meritorious exertions really avail very little with us, but nearness or likeness of nature. How beautiful is the ease of its victory. Persons approach us, famous for their beauty, for their accomplishments, worthy of all wonder for their charms and gifts. They dedicate their whole skill to the hour and the company with very imperfect result. To be sure, it would be ungrateful in us not to praise them loudly. Then, when all is done, a person of related mind, a brother or sister by nature, comes to us so softly and easily, so nearly and intimately, as if it were the blood in our proper veins, that we feel as if someone was gone, instead of another having come. We are utterly relieved and refreshed. It is a sort of joyful solitude. We foolishly think in our days of sin that we must court friends by compliance to the customs of society, to its dress, its breeding, and its estimates. But only that soul can be my friend which I encounter on the line of my own march, that soul to which I do not decline and which does not decline to me, but native of the same celestial latitude, repeats in its own all my experience." The scholar forgets himself and apes the customs and costumes of the man of the world to deserve the smile of beauty and follows some giddy girl, not yet taught by religious passion to know the noble woman with all that is serene, oracular, and beautiful in her soul. Let him be great, and love shall follow him. Nothing is more deeply punished than the neglect of the affinities by which alone society should be formed, and the insane levity of choosing associates by others' eyes." He may set his own rate. It is a maximum worthy of all exception that a man may have that allowance he takes. Take the place and attitude which belong to you, and all men acquiesce. The world must be just. It leaves every man with profound unconcern to set his own rate. Hero or driveler, it meddles not in the matter. It will certainly accept your own measure of your doing and being, whether you sneak about and deny your own name, or whether you see your work produced to the concave sphere of the heavens, one with the revolution of the stars. The same reality pervades all teaching. The man may teach by doing, and not otherwise. If he can communicate himself, he can teach, but not by words. He teaches who gives, and he learns who receives. There is no teaching until the pupil is brought into the same state or principle in which you are. A transfusion takes place. He is you, and you are he. Then is a teaching. And by no unfriendly chance or bad company can he ever quite lose the benefit. But your propositions run out of one ear as they ran into the other. 
we see it advertised that Mr. Grand will deliver an oration on the 4th of July and Mr. Hand before the Mechanics Association. And we do not go thither because we know that these gentlemen will not communicate their own character and experience to the company. If we had reason to expect such a confidence, we should go through all inconvenience and opposition. The sick would be carried in litters. But a public oration is an escapade, a non-committal, an apology, a gag, and not a communication, not a speech, not a man. A like nemesis presides over all intellectual works. We have yet to learn that the thing uttered in words is not therefore affirmed. It must affirm itself, or no forms of logic or of oath can give it evidence. The sentence must also contain its own apology for being spoken. The effect of any writing on the public mind is mathematically measurable by its depth of thought. How much water does it draw? If it awaken you to think, if it lift you from your feet with the great voice of eloquence, then the effect is to be wide, slow, permanent, over the minds of men. If the pages instruct you not, they will die like flies in the hour. The way to speak and write what shall not go out of fashion is to speak and write sincerely. The argument which has not power to reach my own practice, I may well doubt, will fail to reach yours. But take Sidney's maxim, look in thy heart and write. He that writes to himself writes to an eternal public. That statement only is fit to be made public, which you have come at in attempting to satisfy your own curiosity. The writer who takes his subject from his ear and not from his heart should know that he has lost as much as he seems to have gained, and when the empty book has gathered all its praise and half the people say, what poetry, what genius, it still needs fuel to make fire. That only profits which is profitable. Life alone can impart life. And though we should burst, we can only be valued as we make ourselves valuable. There is no luck in literary reputation. They who make up the final verdict upon every book are not the partial and noisy readers of the hour when it appears, but a court as of angels, a public not to be bribed, not to be entreated, and not to be overawed, decides upon every man's title to fame. Only those books come down which deserve to last— gilt edges, vellum and morocco, and presentation copies to all the libraries will not preserve a book in circulation beyond its intrinsic date. It must go with all Walpole's noble and royal authors to its fate. Blackmore, Kotzebue, or Pollock may endure for a night, but Moses and Homer stand forever. There are not in the world at any one time more than a dozen persons who read and understand Plato. Never enough to pay for an edition of his works. Yet to every generation there comes duly down for the sake of those few persons as if God brought them in his hand. No book, said Bentley, was ever written down by any but itself. The permanence of all books is fixed by no effort, friendly or hostile, but by their own specific gravity or the intrinsic importance of their contents to the constant mind of man. Do not trouble yourself too much about the light on your statue, said Michelangelo to the young sculptor. The light of the public square will test its value. In like manner, the effect of every action is measured by the depth of the sentiment from which it proceeds. The great man knew not that he was great. It took a century or two for that fact to appear. What he did, he did because he must. It was the most natural thing in the world and grew out of the circumstances of the moment. But now, everything he did, even to the lifting of his finger or the eating of bread, looks large, all related, and is called an institution." These are the demonstrations in a few particulars of the genius of nature. They show the direction of the stream. But the stream is blood. Every drop is alive. Truth is not single victories. All things are its organs, not only dust and stones, but errors and lies. The laws of disease, physicians say, are as beautiful as the laws of health. Our philosophy is affirmative and readily accepts the testimony of negative facts, as every shadow points to the sun. By a divine necessity, every fact in nature is constrained to offer its testimony. Human character evermore publishes itself. The most fugitive deed and word, the mere air of doing a thing, the intimated purpose expresses character. 
If you act, you show character. If you sit still, if you sleep, you show it. You think because you have spoken nothing when others spoke and have given no opinion on the times, on the church, on slavery, on marriage, on socialism, on secret societies, on the college, on parties and persons, that your verdict is still expected with curiosity as a reserved wisdom. Far otherwise, your silence answers very loud. You have no oracle to utter, and your fellow men have learned that you cannot help them, for oracles speak. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? Dreadful limits are set in nature to the powers of dissimulation. Truth tyrannizes over the unwilling members of the body. Faces never lie, it is said. No man need be deceived who will study the changes of expression. When a man speaks the truth in the spirit of truth, his eye is as clear as the heavens. When he has base ends and speaks falsely, the eye is muddy and sometimes a squint. I have heard an experienced counselor say that he never feared the effect upon a jury of a lawyer who does not believe in his heart that his client ought to have a verdict. If he does not believe it, his unbelief will appear to the jury, despite all his protestations, and will become their unbelief. This is that law whereby a work of art of whatever kind sets us in the same state of mind wherein the artist was when he made it. That which we do not believe, we cannot adequately say, though we may repeat the words never so often. It was this conviction that Swedenborg expressed when he described a group of persons in the spiritual world endeavoring in vain to articulate a proposition which they did not believe. But they could not, though they twisted and folded their lips even to indignation. A man passes for what he is worth, very idle in all curiosity concerning other people's estimates of us, and all fear of remaining unknown is not less so. If a man know that he can do anything, that he can do it better than anyone else, he has a pledge of the acknowledgement of that fact by all persons. The world is full of judgment days, and into every assembly that a man enters, in every action he attempts, he is gauged and stamped. In every troop of boys that whoop and run in each yard and square, a newcomer is as well and accurately weighed in the course of a few days and stamped with his right number, as if he had undergone a formal trial of his strength, speed, and temper. A stranger comes from a distant school with better dress, with trinkets in his pockets, with airs and pretensions. An older boy says to himself, It's of no use. We shall find him out tomorrow. What has he done? is the divine question which searches men and transpierces every false reputation. A fop may sit in any chair of the world, nor be distinguished for his hour from Homer and Washington. But there need never be any doubt concerning the respective ability of human beings. Pretension may sit still, but cannot act. Pretension never feigned an act of real greatness. Pretension never wrote an Iliad, never drove back Xerxes nor Christianized the world, nor abolished slavery. As much virtue as there is, so much appears. As much goodness as there is, so much reverence it commands. All the devils respect virtue. The high, the generous, the self-devoted sect will always instruct and command mankind. Never was a sincere word utterly lost. Never a magnanimity fell to the ground, but there is some heart to greet and accept it unexpectedly. A man passes for that he is worth. What he is engraves itself on his face, on his form, on his fortunes, in letters of light. Concealment avails him nothing, boasting nothing. There is confession in the glances of our eyes, in our smiles, in salutations, and the grasp of hands. His sin bedaubs him, mars all his good impression. Men know not why they do not trust him, but they do not trust him. His vice glasses his eye, cuts lines of mean expression in his cheek, pinches the nose, sets the mark of the beast on the back of the head, and writes, O oh fool, fool, on the forehead of a king. If you would not be known to do anything, never do it. A man may play the fool in the drifts of a desert, but every grain of sand shall seem to see. He may be a solitary eater, but he cannot keep his foolish counsel. A broken complexion, a swinish look, ungenerous acts, and the want of due knowledge, all blab. Can a cook, a chiffinch, an Iacimo be mistaken for Zeno or Paul? 
Confucius exclaimed, How can a man be concealed? How can a man be concealed? On the other hand, the hero fears not that if he withhold the avowal of a just and brave act, it will go unwitnessed and unloved. One knows it himself and is pledged by it to sweetness of peace and to nobleness of aim, which will prove in the end a better proclamation of it than the relating of the incident. Virtue is the adherence in action to the nature of things, and the nature of things makes it prevalent. It consists in a perpetual substitution of being for seeming, and with sublime propriety, God is described as saying, I am. The lesson which these observations convey is be and not seem. Let us acquiesce. Let us take our bloated nothingness out of the path of the divine circuits. Let us unlearn our wisdom of the world. Let us lie low in the Lord's power and learn that truth alone makes rich and great. If you visit your friend, why need you apologize for not having visited him and waste his time and deface your own act? Visit him now. Let him feel that the highest love has come to see him in thee its lowest organ. Or why need you torment yourself and friend by secret self-reproaches that you have not assisted him or complimented him with gifts and salutations heretofore? Be a gift and a benediction. Shine with real light and not with the borrowed reflection of gifts. Common men are apologies for men. They bow the head, excuse themselves with prolix reasons, and accumulate appearances because the substance is not... We are full of these superstitions of sense, the worship of magnitude. We call the poet inactive because he is not a president, a merchant, or a porter. We adore an institution and do not see that it is founded on a thought which we have. But real action is in silent moments. The epochs of our life are not in the visible facts of our choice of a calling, our marriage, our acquisition of an office, and the like, but in a silent thought by the wayside as we walk." in a thought which revises our entire manner of life and says, Thus hast thou done, but it were better thus. And all our after years, like menials, serve and wait on this, and according to their ability execute its will. This revisal or correction is a constant force which, as a tendency, reaches through our lifetime. The object of the man, the aim of these moments, is to make daylight shine through him, to suffer the law to traverse his whole being without obstruction, so that on what point soever of his doing your eye falls, it shall report truly of his character, whether it be his diet, his house, his religious forms, his society, his mirth, his vote, his opposition. Now he is not homogeneous, but heterogeneous, and the ray does not traverse. There are no through lights, But the eye of the beholder is puzzled, detecting many unlike tendencies and a life not yet at one. Why should we make it a point with our false modesty to disparage that man we are and that form of being assigned to us? A good man is contented. I love and honor Epaminondas, but I do not wish to be Epaminondas. I hold it more just to love the world of this hour than the world of his hour. Nor can you, if I am true, excite me to the least uneasiness by saying, He acted, and thou sittest still. I see action to be good when the need is, and sitting still to be also good. Epaminondas, if he was the man I take him for, would have sat still with joy and peace if his lot had been mine. Heaven is large and affords space for all modes of love and fortitude. Why should we be busybodies and super serviceable? Action and inaction are alike to the true. One piece of the tree is cut for a weathercock and one for the sleeper of a bridge. The virtue of the wood is apparent in both. I desire not to disgrace the soul. The fact that I am here certainly shows me that the soul has need of an organ here. Shall I not assume the post? Shall I skulk and dodge and duck with my unseasonable apologies and vain modesty and imagine my being here impertinent? less pertinent than Epaminondas or Homer being there, and that the soul did not know its own needs? Besides, without any reasoning on the matter, I have no discontent. The good soul nourishes me and unlocks new magazines of power and enjoyment to me every day. I will not meanly decline the immensity of good, because I have heard that it has come to others in another shape. Besides, why should we be cowed by the name of action? Tis a trick of the senses." 
no more. We know that the ancestor of every action is a thought. The poor mind does not seem to itself to be anything unless it have an outside badge, some Gentoo diet or Quaker coat or Calvinistic prayer meeting or philanthropic society or a great donation or a high office or, anyhow, some wild contrasting action to testify that it is somewhat. The rich mind lies in the sun and sleeps and is nature. To think is to act. Let us, if we must have great actions, make our own so. All action is of an infinite elasticity, and the least admits of being inflated with the celestial air until it eclipses the sun and moon. Let us seek one peace by fidelity. Let me heed my duties. Why need I go gadding into the scenes and philosophy of Greek and Italian history before I have justified myself to my benefactors? How dare I read Washington's campaigns when I have not answered the letters of my own correspondence? Is not that a just objection to much of our reading. It is a pusillanimous desertion of our work to gaze after our neighbors. It is peeping. Byron says of Jack Bunting, he knew not what to say, and so he swore. I may say it of our preposterous use of books, he knew not what to do, and so he read. I can think of nothing to fill my time with, and I find the life of Brant. It is a very extravagant compliment to pay to Brandt or to General Schuller or to General Washington. My time should be as good as their time, my facts, my net of relations as good as theirs or either of theirs. Rather, let me do my work so well that other idlers, if they choose, may compare my texture with the texture of these and find it identical with the best. This overestimate of the possibilities of Paul and Pericles, this underestimate of our own, comes from a neglect of the fact of an identical nature. Bonaparte knew but one merit and rewarded in one in the same way the good soldier, the good astronomer, the good poet, the good player. The poet uses the names of Caesar, of Tamerlan, of Banduca, of Belisarius. The painter uses the conventional story of the Virgin Mary, of Paul, of Peter. He does not, therefore, defer to the nature of these accidental men, of these stock heroes. If the poet write a true drama, then he is Caesar, and not the player of Caesar. Then the selfsame strain of thought, emotion as pure, wit as subtle, motions as swift, mounting extravagant, and a heart as great, self-sufficing, dauntless, which on the waves of its love and hope can uplift all that is reckoned solid and precious in the world. Palaces, gardens, money, navies, kingdoms, marking its own incomparable worth by the slight it casts on these gods of men. These all are his, and by the power of these he rouses the nations. Let a man believe in God and not in names and places and persons. Let the great soul incarnated in some woman's form, poor and sad and single, in some dolly or joan, go out to service and sweep chambers and scour floors, and its effulgent daybeams cannot be muffled or hid, but to sweep and scour will instantly appear supreme and beautiful actions, the top and radiance of human life, and all people will get mops and brooms, until, lo, suddenly the great soul has enshrined itself in some other form and done some other deed, and that is now the flower and head of all living nature." We are the photometers. We are the irritable gold leaf and tin foil that measure the accumulations of the subtle element. We know the authentic effects of the true fire through every one of its million disguises. Spiritual Laws by Rolf Waldo Emerson Narrated by Joseph Vobel This has been an Aged Quill Audiobooks production.